Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. Shane Gosses Bear saw the conversation about him not getting any five on five points, mostly just production on the power play, and then him maybe not being able to reach 10 goals by the end of the year. He took it personally last night. Good. He should have. You know what? I thought he was gonna I thought he was honestly gonna score the Hattie and reach 10 last night alone. Those last few shifts, he was going for it. That was one of the most blatant attempts I've seen from a defenseman to just get a goal. And hey, you're up by five. <laughs> by all means, buddy. I respect it. It was Detroit's offense that was winning them that game. So you may as well yeah. lean into it more. Yeah, a hundred percent. And his teammates were force feeding him the puck at that point as well. So it helps when you have Lucas Raymond, you know doing that little shimmy at the blue line to get on the puck in the middle. It, everything was going his way. I, I don't care. I don't care about anything where Detroit has to be worried in the future right now. Like I know there's big conversations to come about the cap and how they're going to fit these guys in with all these contracts and you know what they're going to do if they get to the playoffs and how are they going to match up against teams who uh, are going to really outpace them five on five. doesn't matter. Shut up nerds. Yeah. Like the, the Detroit <laughs> is, Detroit just dummied Washington last night. That game, every time Washington tried to get back in that game, Detroit just stepped on the gas harder. De- Washington, who, they have guys on the roster who would do this. They didn't even try to like literally fight back. There was no, they knew they were done. They had, from what I can remember, about two, three minute stretches where they kept it interesting. And one of those stretches culminated with a Red Wings shorthanded goal with 13 seconds left in the that second. That was a dagger, man. And it looked casual. That was because that was the only moment in the game. Because I think it was four two at the time. Washington had just scored. They got the power play. They were controlling play for the last bit of that period. And I'm like, oh, maybe this is going to be a game because it didn't look like a game to that point. And then that goal, and I'm like, no, yeah, we're done here. This so what have over. I missed since the last time I was on an episode? What was that? Two Wednesday, Thursday not, last week, Wednesday. You not, missed one episode, and the Red Wings were kind enough to not only keep the good vibes going, they expanded them. No kidding! What a what a week for the Red Wings! Holy, it is. It's never been like this. Like you know when we talk in the off season, like man, that it's been a lot of years of really down hockey of us covering this team, or forget us, like Ken and Mick, for example, like a lot of years where they've had to instill artificially a lot of excitement in the game. But man, it's going to be so sweet when it pays off. It feels like it's paying off right now. Like this feels like the start of the payoff. You can think of a few moments each year where there was some level of optimism. And for how long that optimism lasted, it was very short. This year, it feels like other than December, it's been an all time high. you wake up excited as a Red Wings fan right now. That's the crazy part about it. I know it's it feels weird to wipe an entire month because it's 20% of the season so far. But imagine what this team's record would be if you took out December. Uh, I'm not but, even I'm not playing the what if game right now. I'm just enjoying it at the moment. No, that's what I mean. I'm trying to find all the things to enjoy and envisioning the other four months of the season only. This team's up there with like Boston at this point. Another All Vibes episode coming at you with the Winged Wheel Podcast. Welcome to the show. Here to talk to you about all things Detroit Red Wings hockey, the world of the NHL, and lots more. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Hanna. I'm Brad Kriska. And I'm Evan. Welcome back, buddy. Glad to be back. Nothing could bring you back from the dead except for a Red Wings six-game win streak. Well, it's the first time in forever that the Red Wings have been basically national news. (laughs) Unreal. Everyone's talking about them. Yeah. I listened to about four other hockey podcasts semi regularly. The Red Wings were the lead topic on all of them. And that's ne- I've never I don't ever remember them being the lead topic on one of them. You're damn right. On this episode of the Winged Wheel podcast, we're going to obviously be recapping the Red Wings' dominant win over the Washington Capitals. Uh, all the storylines out of that: Gosses, Bear, Valeno, Raymond, uh, the top line, which we haven't even mentioned in their clinical goal. Mo Sider being a warrior. Uh, Hutch bringing the Lions presence, sounding the goal horn, and uh, lots more. Uh, we'll be talking about Lucas Raymond and just giving him his flowers, really. like that. We've been talking about him all season. I know we're big Lucas Raymond fans on this podcast, but when you talk about the Red Wings being national news, he's the title of quite a bit of that. 
Uh, we'll be talking more about the trade deadline, how Detroit's involved, what they're looking for, and, and any news on that front. And then news from uh, elsewhere around the organization, Sebastian Cosa in the AHL, speed of getting his flowers, getting a lot of recognition for how he's been playing. And then uh, to deflate the vibes a little bit, or not really the most welcome news, but uh looks like the the honeymoon's over. A jersey patch is coming, and we'll talk about what that means uh, and lots more before overtime. Before all that, uh, two things. First, if you bought tickets to Winged Wheel Podcast Now Day at the LCA for Saturday, March 2nd, which is this Saturday, uh, everything has moved up. You'll be getting an email from the Red Wings. We'll give you more information at the end of the show. But uh, the quick gist of it, doors open to the Budweiser Beer Garden at noon. The podcast starts recording at 12.30 p.m. It'll feature Ken Daniels there. Uh, you'll get information in an email from the Red Wings on how you get your ticket and uh, the voucher with the ticket. It'll be loaded onto the same account, and that's how you get into the event, get your co-branded hat and everything. And before we jump into it, the Winged Wheel Podcast is supported almost entirely by our Patreon supporters. Patreon.com slash Winged Wheel Podcast if you want to join the Dub Dub Club and support the show. You get access to our bonus overtime episodes, which we record right after these main ones. You also get access to our Winged Wheel Podcast exclusive Discord. Additionally, you're automatically entered into all of our giveaways. We give away two tickets to every Detroit Red Wings home game, the vast majority going directly to our Patreon supporters. So again, patreon.com slash Winged Wheel Podcast. Detroit came into the Washington game. And that was an important one, not because Washington was close, but if Detroit really wanted to put distance between them and the Capitals and, you know, next game, them and the Islanders, all these teams behind them, like Detroit's looking at Tampa Bay and Toronto mainly right now, but for all the teams behind them who could be troublesome down the road, it is better to eliminate them now, put the finishing blow in now, because at the trade deadline, you're forcing GMs to make decisions and you do that early enough you essentially put them out of the race before March even hits like the, you get into mid March and it becomes problematic. Detroit dominated Detroit dominated them, not to the tune where they dominated St. Louis, but not terribly far off in terms of what they were able to do pretty much at will on offense. That was at points clinical. Yeah, it was very close to what they did to St. Louis again until that, stretched near the end of the second period it never felt like Washington was in it the only goal they had to that point was just because you know their generational player had to make an unbelievable play yeah just to get them on the board and the first 30 35 minutes of the game it was entirely one-sided and you can point to a million different directions as to why it wasn't like the top line was carrying them or the top pair or the power player whatever it was every shift all over them. Didn't look like they belonged in the same league. It's hard to think about after the heroics at the United Center that, you know, Kane put up for the the story to keep going and for Hockey Town to be spoiled with yet another notable performance. Even if it was a win, but like a quiet win, like just a, a run in the mill win. Detroit really hasn't had a run in the mill game in a while here. You would think that that would be the next step. But no, Detroit has continued the theatrics in the best way. Eight goals for the first time this season. And we'll, we'll go through them here. And a lot of them are really notable in how they happened. The first one is Joe Valeno picked up a puck entering the slot area. And it happened so fast because he was so skilled in how he did it. But Pele over there, foot to skate, like so naturally and immediately made the decision to pass off to the right to Shane Gossesbear, who one time did in. Bullet of a shot. Lindgren played it poorly in net, but... Goss's bear made like a, it was a perfect shot. And when Valeno made the decision to pass out of the slot, I went, ah, like in that split second, I was like, oof, putting it out of the high danger area. Like you would have liked to have seen a shot on and it's in. And that worked out perfectly. That was a sick play from Valeno. Yeah. Valeno, probably the most unheralded player on this team. His stat line's not all that dissimilar to Rasmussen's and he's played a majority of the season in a smaller role. Than Rasmussen, and yet he continues to do what he's doing. There are so many players on the Red Wings where we say uh, at the start of the season, like these guys need to have a big year within the realm of what's realistic for them for this team to be dominant, and it kind of needs to be all of them. Like, man, Raymond is the like the figurehead of that. Larkin has elevated his game, but yeah, Rasmussen, not like a tougher start, but really rounded into form. Valeno just constantly being the best version of Valeno that we thought was possible. 
they're playing for contracts, mind you. So you can understand a lot of motivation besides just wanting to win, but it's really benefited Detroit. Lucas Raymond scored to make it 2 nothing late in the first period. Great play from Rasmussen and then Comfort to find Raymond in front. Raymond made no mistake. Raymond in the slot right now, like that kind of area. You have a lot of faith that that puck's going in. That was Raymond's 17th of the year as he approaches 20 goals. And in the second period, that's when Hendrix Lackpierre scored when, as Brad mentioned, Ovi made a great play to find him in front. Similarly, picking the puck up, corralling it. That's about as easy of a goal as you're going to get in the NHL. The pass got around line. Like, Lapierre didn't even have to do anything, really. Yeah, the, pl- the whole play was very Joe Valeno-esque. Yeah. <laughs> Ovi should be so lucky. <laughs> it, was, it was Devin on Twitter who said the, the Red Wings... Uh, it was a tribute to Ovechkin. That's why they scored eight goals. <laughs> it was a tribute to Daniel Sprong, really, for his original number. Joe Valeno then scored almost as impressive as his setup, but stepping into the slot and firing at home, like, that was a Valeno game. It was almost a shame that there were so many goals after that, because Valeno really should have been the poster of that game for the Red Wings. Uh, Shane Gossespierre got his second goal of the game. That was the ninth of the year. It technically was right after the power play expired, so he gets an extra five-on-five five point there. <laughs> but... That play, watch Lucas Raymond at the blue line. Just inside the blue line at the right side, a little shimmy to shake the defender, steps inside and finds Goss Spare coming in hot. Like that was, you want to see what we mean by Lucas Raymond is playing confidently. Lucas Raymond is executing, using his hockey IQ and making like driving play, creating chances. That's a perfect example of what we mean. And if you want to know that a player has some confidence, watch a guy juke two players within a foot of the blue line. You know how risky that spot on the ice is? And, and he made it look like light work. Walks the first guy and then the pulls the second guy over to him and doesn't fire a bullet to Goss's bear. Just a soft little sauce over the defender's stick. Goss's bear just can walk right into it. Just, you, you hear the phrase setting it up on a platter? Like, mm-hmm. just, here you go, buddy. And that was Take a theme. It. And then, obviously... Gosper walked into it and just ripped it high blockers. So just a beautiful Bear. play all around. Gosses Bear shot it and went, that's two. <laughs> Third's coming. Uh, Washington actually made it 4-2. And they had a power play then late in the period where you're like, ooh, this could really change the tides. Like it was all, the vibes were all in Detroit's favor going into that. And late power play was going to extend into the third period. And you're like, Detroit, this is a key kill for them. Not only did they kill it, the puck broke out and cop going down the right side, JT Comfort with him down the middle. And it was almost casual the way they took advantage of the odd man rush cop over to Comfort, who made no mistake ripping at home Comfort having himself probably one of the more unappreciated uh, performances of the night rips at home for the, the easiest looking, most casual looking shorthanded goal I've seen in a long time. And not only does Detroit kill the penalty ultimately, but they, that was the dagger really in Washington. Couple things. One, it looks so casual because uh, I don't know which Capital was back for that two on one, but could not have played that any more poorly. And hey, capitalize when they do. No pun intended. And I, I know I meant tweeted about it last night, but how many times have we been on the other side of that absolutely back breaking goal in a critical situation when you thought maybe there was a sliver of hope? Yeah. That, that, that's been like the MO for the Red there Wings. There was a string of time where the Red Wings were giving up shorthanded goals almost every game, it felt like. It, the heartbreaking moments to start the game, which, I mean, we're not really that far removed from that, but yeah, the backbreaking goal when Detroit has the smallest window, and when you're like, if they're ever going to get back in it, now's the moment. Get yourself pumped up, and they got scored on shorthanded. And now we're on the other side of it. Now Detroit's on the other side of the blowout games. That made it 5-2, and by then... By then, the Washington Capitals would have told you it was over, but the story didn't end there. In the third period, Patrick Kane decided he wanted to extend his point streak to nine games. Perfect pass to Robbie Fabry. Went through the gap between the player's knee and the toe of his skate as he went down to try to block the pass, the the Capitals defender, to Robbie Fabry, who did nothing but have his stick on the ice. That was the second easiest goal you can score in the NHL. (laughs) And Robbie Fabry scores the easy goals too. Sometimes players from the other team shoot it off him and in. And you can see his little, like his moment where he froze there. He just kind of looked at Kane, like smiling, <laughs> like big Don Cherry voice. Like, keep your stick on the ice, kids. Like that, that's exactly why. If you're playing with Patrick Kane, keep your stick on the ice because that puck's coming to you. And uh, credit Daniel Sprung got the secondary assist. We were joking before 
we started recording. Poor Daniel Sprong against Chicago scored a highlight reel goal while falling. And it wasn't like on his strong side. Like he had to that he had to fire it at an awkward angle, scored while falling. Would have been highlighted of the night a lot of nights, but unfortunately, there were two bigger highlights just for the storyline after that. Daniel Sprong is still doing Daniel Sprong things. So he got in on that goal. Washington did get one more in, uh, but Detroit scored twice more after that. To bring it from Larkin and Kane. I'm sorry. I know it's not like the nicest goal of the season, but in terms of pure hockey, like that's, that is the best hockey I've seen Detroit play on offense. That Kane to Larkin to Debrinket goal is, that should have been rated R to watch. If you put the definition of a tic-tac-toe goal in the dictionary, you could put that one in there and everybody would immediately go, ah, yes, I see. It was the most like classic, fundamentally sound tic-tac-toe toe the moment the puck reached to brink it and you saw that he was uncovered that was in a hundred percent that was in to it scores his 23rd he's scored i think four goals now since his little slump was called out and larkin and kane factor into the game when you know they weren't really on the scoreboard before the third period and you thought wow what a nice way to cap this game off and then lucas raymond made a great play to make it eight as he found dylan larkin with about five or six minutes left in the third period, and that was ultimately 8-3. Lucas Raymond, I think that's now 25 points in his last 24 games, and that was that was the most utterly dominant performance you could possibly expect against the Washington Capitals, who the way they've been winning this year is by not, not by scoring a lot. They don't allow a lot of goals, and Detroit just said, yeah, well, too bad. They've actually been playing some rather decent hockey lately, given how poorly their season started. Not dissimilar to what Detroit did against St. Louis. They were playing decent hockey, and then all of a sudden Detroit just kind of slapped them around, and they were pretty shook up after that. Well, when you get a whole bunch of wildcard contenders against each other, it's nice to see the actual playoff teams separate themselves. It, I think that's what, like, I, <laughs> when people are like, why, what makes this team different? Why do you have so much more hope in what they're doing now? And yeah, you can look at the standings, but there were points last year where Detroit was looking pretty good in the standings, and it's just like who Detroit's doing it against this year. It feels different. They're separating themselves against the teams where they should be separating themselves. They're even stealing wins against top teams like Vancouver. Yeah. When you get ultimately put to the test, like against Edmonton, you can see the disparity there, but also they stole a game against Colorado, but the teams around them, like their peers in terms of who's competing for a wild card spot, Detroit's thumping them. And Detroit's showing up to play playoff hockey. And Detroit showing up has been half the battle a lot of times. As their roster has been improving over the last few seasons, it's like learning how to put that together at the right time. They weren't able to do that. And this is now not even the first time in the last little while that they had a specific test in the context of a a tight wildcard race. And they put their foot on the gas and left their opponents in the dust. Yep. And it's showing now by an eight-point lead on ninth place. Which, and again, is probably worth repeating. Ninth place isn't chasing them. No. They're chasing the second wildcard team, which is Tampa. And they're chasing the third Metro seed, Philly, who is lower points and points percentage than the Red Wings. And might sell at the deadline. Yeah. I know injuries have kind of muddled that for them, but it was a great, like, you need to be beating these teams to make it not even a question. And Detroit did just that. To be fair to Washington, they were on a back-to-back, and I'm sure if they could, you know, make the schedule, I think they would have preferred to play Detroit the night before rather than Ottawa, but how many times have we seen the Red Wings play a team who's on a back-to-back and lay an absolute egg? So yeah, to have a, a tired Washington team come in, and they did look tired, the Red Wings worked them pretty good, and to see the Red Wings pull out a win there and a, a dominant win was, you know, a refreshing change of pace. Probably worth pointing out that there were, that was the Red Wings' fourth game in six nights with travel. They've been on a ruthless schedule. Yeah, they had every right to be just as exhausted as Washington, and they weren't. And okay, so on that note, I want to talk about Mo Sider. Like Detroit, tired they, as every team is at this time of year. So I'm not going to say it's anything special, but they were already winning by a lot at points in the game when this was happening. And on at least two occasions, Mo Sider took a puck to the leg, blocking a shot. And he was hobbled. Like, it hurt. It was like Mo Sider's rookie season when you're like, ah, he needs to make get some bigger, thicker pads because he's getting hurt a lot off of these without missing games. 
but he was hobbled and he stayed out and made a key clear on the ice, you know, with Ovi bearing down on him or whatever it was. And he like roughed out the play and really gritted it out. And he did that when they were up like several goals or like multiple goals. Like the, that, that's just the kind of hockey the Red Wings are playing. And if you want to know whether these guys are thinking we need to be playing playoff hockey right now, look at him doing that on the ice and look at the, the sticks tapping the boards from the bench both before he gets back to the bench and when he gets back in. Like, this team is playing for each other, and they are not letting their foot off the gas, even when they know they have the game in the bag. On one hand, you want to tell Mo, hey, you're up by three or four, and that's Alex Ovechkin. Get the hell out of the way. But on the other hand, winning teams don't do that. No, they don't. That's the difference. That's Remember the when difference. Tampa won the cup and everybody was blocking shots and Steven Stamkos went down the tunnel probably four times in one game because he... Just kept getting in those shooting lanes. You know, there's a reason why teams like that are successful year in and year out, and they refuse to to rebuild and they refuse to let relinquish the playoffs. It's because of stuff like that. That was great to see. We also got confirmation from the team. Derek Lalonde confirmed that Mo Sider is going to be playing the next game. So talk about an Iron Man streak. He's not missed a game in his career so far, and there have been a lot of moments where he's taken a shot or something to the leg. When I was like. Oof. He plays big and heavy. I don't even want to get into it about the people who think Mo Sider's not having a good, important season. Yeah, he might not be putting up the best expected goals based on whatever metric, but how high is he on block shots right now playing against the toughest minutes, you know, the hardest players to play against in the league? And with, again, you want to talk about holes on this Red Wings team, their their defensive depth isn't good, so that's, that's coming from Mo Sider. That was a, a gutsy performance by Sider. Talking about, you know, grit, I love this team of Detroit Lions showing up in and around Red Wings games, and then they thumped the team that night. This one was Aiden Hutchinson sounding the goal horn before the game, getting the crowd pumped up, which just, like, fire me up, man. I'm already ready to run through a wall when I watch Red Wings hockey right now. And uh, what did what did Newsy say after the game? He has a bat signal out to Dan Campbell. <laughs> Look, we all want it now, but the best way to do this is – Opening video montage, which the Red Wings production team always does such an incredible job, both on broadcast, but like in arena video productions, like nothing will get you more hyped up. I'm getting tingles thinking about it than like the, the pregame stuff. And before a playoff game, they'll have the video montage of the season. They'll have the moment of Kane scoring at the United Center with Ken calling it. They'll have, you know, every big moment from the season. And then you just know it's going to be a Dan Campbell motivational speech in the Red Wings dressing room. That's how they're going to feature Dan Campbell giving the Red Wings his talk. Like That's just like the best way to do it, right? Did you do it in the first round or do you wait for the second round? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is it cheap to, to then reuse it in the cup finals or? <laughs> no, absolutely not. Look, man, they, good vibes are contagious and they can make you say some silly things and the vibes are getting high. I'm about to say some silly things about the playoffs. Like the rationality is going out the window pretty soon. I'm not yeah. saying anything. You're, you don't yeah, want to you get caught on he- camera? No, I'm not. <laughs> you just let me know when I need to face the camera and look at it when I say something dumb. He's been hurt before. I'm just using the advanced analytics, and it says the Red Wings have not made the playoffs a lot in our podcast uh, history. So <laughs> and, and until I see that X beside their name, I'm not saying anything dumb. That's the mentality they have, too. Until they see that clinched next to their name, they're going to be playing just as hard and, and not taking anything for granted. See, the difference here is Ryan and I, last episode, said we're pretty confident this team's going to make the playoffs and we're on that upward trajectory of confidence so that when they do make the playoffs, obviously we'll be happier, but we've already kind of gotten there. So it won't be too extreme. Evan's going to go from, they're not making it. They're not making it, not saying, not saying anything to running naked in the streets that night. Yeah. Our, our, our streams are going to get demonetized so fast. (laughs) You're welcome. Let's talk about the playoff positioning right now. At the time of recording, Detroit has 72 points in 59 games. Tampa Bay is in the second wild card spot. Detroit's in the first. Tampa Bay has 69 points. Nice. Three points behind Detroit. And they have two more games played. So Detroit has two games in hand. The New Jersey Devils have 64 points. So eight points behind, as Brad mentioned. Really, the teams behind Detroit aren't too much of a threat right now. But anything can happen and those points can close up quick. Washington behind them, one game in hand on New Jersey, so they could technically get to 65 points. Pittsburgh, New York Islanders, and that's all that's realistic at this point. Detroit is two points back of the Maple Leafs. 
They the least have one game in hand on Detroit, but Detroit is two points back. They have the same amount of regulation wins. The third Atlantic seed is in play. April 13th is the next, the last time, the next and last time Toronto and Detroit play each other. In the regular season. In the regular season. That's, look, Toronto did a great job of playing through the Riley suspension. They've done a great job galvanizing around that moment and... They've powered through. They're one of the hotter teams in the NHL right now, too. They're 8-2-0 and in their last 10. Detroit 7-2-1. and But if Detroit, even despite Toronto going 8-2-0, it manages to hunt them down and, and take that third divisional seed, yeah, you're guaranteeing yourself that you're going to play one of Florida or Boston, but who cares at this point? Like That is a massive accomplishment, especially when you look at the disparity of the rosters. Oh, 100%. It would be a more fun matchup, more entertaining. Definitely another feather in your cap. In the off season, if you get the three seed versus the wild card, first wild card is probably where they want to finish, though, right? In case they can play one of the, I don't, I the think Rangers I, are nine and one in their last ten. The Rangers are unreal, but I still think I'd rather play the Rangers than Florida or Boston. I don't want to play Florida for some reason. You know what? Boston just not scaring me as much as I thought they would. Well, we beat them twice this year, and if that's why I'm not yeah. all that afraid. And if we want. A playoff series just solely based on entertainment value. Yeah, you want Boston. A hundred percent you want Boston. Maybe there's a reality that could get real fun if one of Florida or Boston just craters and Toronto Detroit end up as the two three. Could you imagine? That if Detroit gets this isn't happening. Like I'm just gonna put this out there. Like the That's vibes are high. But. The vibes are high. We're enjoying this, but we're gonna stay within reason. But in the hypothetical that Detroit walks into the playoffs with home ice advantage. Oh my god. I'm losing my mind. Well, the Red Wings are significantly their winning percentage is significantly higher at home than on the road. So, if they can secure home ice advantage and opponent be damned in the first round, that's a huge advantage for the team. I have sent a message. I will I will freely admit on this podcast that I have sent a message to multiple people including you guys that I think this is a team that can steal games in a playoff round. I will admit to that much irrationality right now. I'm not going to put much else on air, but yeah, you're riding some high vibes and no, they're not going to win every game for the rest of the season. But if for the first time in the Steve Eiserman era, the Red Wings are on a six game winning streak, which is what they're on right now. And the way they're playing, they have a, a 20 positive plus 27 goal differential. Yeah. I'm going to be thinking about, you know, it's not going to be a cakewalk against the Red Wings. Teams who might be playing the Red Wings, I guarantee you they're looking at this team right now thinking, I don't want to play these guys. That is not an easy wild card matchup. Can you imagine being the two division leaders and seeing in the wild card Detroit and Tampa Bay? That's horrifying. Right now, I have two trains of thought in terms of the Red Wings playoff path. One. Brag about it. Two thoughts at the same time. Look at this guy. Well, I, I'm going to speak slowly. I got it. <laughs> It's going to be tough. I think Detroit, if they got matched up against Boston or Florida, one of the Atlantic teams there, they could keep the series interesting. Again, I don't think they'll be the favorites. And ultimately, I don't think they'd win a series against either of those two. But if you, six, seven games wouldn't surprise me, especially with the way Alex Lyon's playing and, you know, the great equalizer goaltending could be. My only other thought is if the Red Wings end up in the Metro bracket, is which of the Atlantic teams they would play in the conference final. <laughs> the is, problem is you have to get through New York. And then Carolina. And then again, what Atlantic team would they play? Because that's going to happen. <laughs> Shesterkin's starting to figure out his season, which is alarming. They've He's, been relying on Jonathan Quick <laughs> having a renaissance season to kind of get keep them on track. Shesterkin waking up terrifies me significantly. And I am... I'm not a fan of playing the Rangers in the it's, first round. It's all found money. They're going to be scared of no one. Because there's going to be zero expectations in that no, first round. No, the, vi- the, the win will be making the playoffs in the fashion they did. Detroit could go 500 the rest of the way, which would still almost certainly get them a playoff spot. Probably wild card too. They could walk into Florida and get swept four games cleanly, and we'd be sitting here going, great season. Yeah. Phenomenal. Great season. So anything above and beyond that is house money. And teams almost tend to play better when they have that. We're just, we're happy. This doesn't matter. We can play loose. We can play free. 
And like, obviously they're going to play hard. I'm not saying they're not going to battle their asses off, but it's just that mentality of found money. Well, they still have 23 games to go. So, (laughs) but there's still a lot to discover about this hockey team and where their, what their overall trajectory is. Evan's trying to get, Evan's trying to slow us down. Yeah. (laughs) Got to get you two back in this galaxy. This is what happens when you leave for an episode. I, and I knew missing the Sunday episode where the (laughs) vibes were just. Uh, another world that this is what I would come back to. That's but your fault. The it thing is. is, Ryan and I, I think it was before last episode, before we started recording, we were trying to be rational. We were doing math. You can't be rational after last episode. No, no. We, the but the we, script was too good. We did math. If they play 500 the rest of the season, and that was before the win against Washington. They're at 95 points if they play 500 the rest of the 95 season. 95 points. That's a playoff spot. They... All they have to do is be extraordinarily average the rest of the year. And they're in. And if you look at the NHL as a whole, actual 500 points percentage, like two thirds of the league does it. It's not that difficult. So given their strength of schedule, given that, yeah, I don't. Is this heater going to keep up the rest of the season? 23 more games? No, of course not. I keep thinking every game is the next trap game. Like you've been expecting it forever and it hasn't happened. We're well aware of how this is going to go, but the crazy thing that brings the vibe so high is it doesn't matter. I like they I have would, the cushion. I would go so far as to say, and again, I don't remember every team, every individual season, but the true choke jobs you can always remember. If the Red Wings, where they are now, miss the playoffs, that's probably the biggest choke job of the salary cap era. In terms of like standings drops, where before. they are at this point in the season relative to how many points cushion they have, there's probably a couple of the teams who are close, but this would be up. You have an eight point cushion yeah. with 23 games to go. We were talking after December that by history of the NHL standings, a four point gap is a chasm. Once you get into the second half of the season four, an eight point gap. And that's not even factoring in Tampa and Philly actually being closer to these teams. <laughs> yeah. And I think the the whole, you know, ironic thing of this is the team itself would say, well, there's 23 games left and we're only eight points up. That, that's right. Yeah. Their mentality isn't what we're talking about. Their mentality is we want to be 12 points up. We want to be 14 points up. Yeah, we're just talking math and history right yeah. now. This is purely what they're thinking is we need to be blocking shots so Mo doesn't have to be blocking shots, but the shots will be blocked, damn it. All right. Upcoming the Red Wings have on Thursday night an important game against the Islanders. Talk about teams in the chasing pack. They also fit into that metro equation that Brad was talking about, you know, more chasing the second wild card spot in Philly, but it's an important game and then on Saturday you know, they're not exactly competing for the same spots, but uh, the Florida Panthers are a divisional foe. So It's a w- statement game. It is. It is. Are the Red Wings pretenders, or are they actually going to try and make some noise? You know, how they re- come out on Saturday at home on Wing Wheel Podcast Day is is huge. This will be a very good indication of where this team truly is against. Florida might be the best team in the league right now. It, it feels almost unfair to put that on Detroit. You're right. But it feels almost unfair to put that on after they beat Colorado last week. I know. Yeah. Well, the, every, <laughs> there's so many teams that I would say are the best team in the league right now. And there's everyone's kind of vying for that crown. But I truly believe Florida is one of the, if not the best team in the NHL. All right. Let's, let's bring the good vibes out of the hypothetical. Because I think we freely admit that we've been enjoying the Red Wings run. And we've been getting ahead of ourselves talking about playoffs. And anything can happen. But let's talk about something that's been... You know, just as positive, but is very real and has already been substantiated, which is Lucas Raymond's breakout season. And last night was a great example. He was doing it all over the ice. We talked about his move at the blue line, his goal, his no doubter goal in front. He has been like stretching back into late 2023, but all of 2024, he's, there has been no gap in Lucas Raymond's dominance as one of the best Red Wings players on the ice. And most nights he is Detroit's like one of their top two or three players. He is getting noticed around the league now. If you talk about the Red Wings getting national attention, they're looking a lot at Lucas Raymond, you know, a a plus 70 point pace. This guy is already a star and he is showing you why that writing him off last season after a very normal sophomore slump was a mistake because he has all the makings to be a a big star in Detroit. 
Yeah, but is 70 points that impressive when you're at the ripe old age of, let me check, 21? Yeah. <laughs> it's not even 22 until the end of March. Like, it's, this kid is something, like, he is turning out exactly, like, when we talked about Lucas Raymond's draft profile, when we said, what are his best case scenarios, like, this is up there in terms of the best possible thing you could have expected in Lucas Raymond's third season in the NHL. There's still lots of room to grow. That's the truly exciting part about it. And the other truly exciting part about the last little hot stretch is uh, obviously he's been good for the whole year, but that was with Dylan Larkin for most of it. He just had maybe his best game of the season with Rasmussen and Comfer. Mm -hmm. He's driving a line. He is the reason that Kane to bring it and Larkin can play together because now they can throw out a second line that features a 70 point player and they're winning their matchups. Cause we've talked at length this year and going into the season, how this team's biggest weakness was going to be their second line because they had, they could construct an above average first line based on the talent they have. And we know what the depth that their third and fourth line will win the matchups against a lot of other teams, third and fourth lines. But the second line was a real problem talent-wise compared to average NHL second lines and even more so playoff teams second lines. This is a whole new ball game if Raymond can anchor that line and Comfer and Rasmussen can keep up their end of the bargain. And let's also recognize JT Comfer is no slouch. I don't think he's someone moonlighting in a top six. I think he is on a you know middle of the pack team a good or at the most pessimistic, a very acceptable second line center. And he's been working out great in Detroit. Like he has been, I've really liked his game all year. And even when he like, you know, fell off a little bit or the production slowed in and around his injury, he has been excellent. So a lot of credit to him, but you're right, Brad, after Raymond adjusted and was able to start driving play and creating offense and just anchoring that line, it elevated comfort and it made it completely you wouldn't even notice that it's Rasmussen that they're pulling up into that second line. We love Rasmussen. We just had an episode talking about, you know, how great and valuable he is for this team. His optimum position isn't on the second line. This is why we say Detroit could use another top six forward. And then you slot Rasmussen in your bottom six, and then you're just dominating teams defensively. But you wouldn't even know it because of what Raymond is able to create right now. He has unlocked so much in the top six. And when we talk about, you know, what would make a great Red Wing season, we talked all off season about it. If they're going to make that big step to make us look stupid in our ultra conservative opinions or predictions on what they're going to do, Lucas Raymond is going to be the main driver of that. Sometimes people, you know, from national media, they'll reach out and they'll be like, what are the storylines that we need to be talking about when we cover the Red Wings? Like for a season preview, for example, we always say it starts and ends with Lucas Raymond and how he can take the step this year. He took the biggest possible step that you could possibly imagine. And he's getting better every game. Well, he pushed his chips in uh, in the off season, right? Like, you know, when you're a little bit undersized, you get pushed off the puck more easily. You know, that really plays at a, at your confidence, right? Like, you're like, can I can I really match up with the elite guys in the NHL? Well, Lucas Raymond came out of the off season looking like an absolute, looking like the juggernaut, and <laughs> now he has the comp. Like, when he has board battles, he wins them more often than he loses them because he's got such great lower body strength now. And that just helps, you know, mentally motivate you and keep you confident that, oh, yeah, like I can now hang with these guys. And you can see he's just brimming with confidence right now, especially last game with some of the moves he was pulling off. And he's, you know, having the goals he's scoring, he sh he's firing them right away. And they're going in. I think it all started in the off season with creating some belief in himself there. And man, I don't know where this kid's going to go in terms of growth, but it this year feels like it's almost been exponential. Well, I think the biggest thing his physical growth did for him this year, if you want to know how it translates on the ice, is he's hanging on to the puck a lot longer. He is in no rush to get rid of it when he has it. And that could be a direct result of... Yeah, if I face some contact, I'm not going to get pushed off the puck. I mm -hmm. can handle a little bit of contact. And again, that assist to Gosses Bear on the blue line, he had zero concern about losing the puck there in a situation like that in a very tight window. Because obviously he's got a defender on his right. He's got the blue line on his left. He does not have a lot of options there. Zero concern. Zero rush. I'm, Just, uh, 
I'm super interested to know how much him and Patrick Kane are talking because that was like the textbook like back back nine of Patrick Kane's career type move where he just changes the pace, slows it up, and and hits that the the trailing guy. It was just. Lucas Raymond pulled a vintage Patrick Kane and I was one. So it's got me kind of wondering, you know, how much are they, are they talking? How much is Lucas Raymond picking Patrick Kane's brain? Because it was very Patrick Kane esque. I don't we, know if you read my show notes, but that is like Lucas Raymond has I, talked I, about. I can't read. So no, that's no, that's a not. great point. Lucas Raymond has talked about, you know, watching Patrick Kane in practice and picking it up from him. And I know it's easy to say, and people might discount that, but we've talked about it a lot. That matters. It matters when you bring talent onto the team. It elevates the players around him. And if you have players who have all the tools and you want them to learn how to use them better, like that development doesn't only happen when you're in the juniors. It happens at the NHL level. And to watch what Patrick Kane does in practice and in games and to be able to learn from him, pick his brain, practice with him, ask him how he practices. like, Well, just seeing him go about his day-to-day too, right? Like you might think, oh, I've got this figured out. And then you see a guy like him who's obviously had a – illustrious career and that watch his day-to-day it's like oh maybe i could you know take a little bit of this from how he does his things and it pays off for everybody and it's not just i like raymond we're going to continue talking about him in a second but it's not just raymond who's talked about it like the whole team is just enamored with what patrick kane brings to this team dylan larkett calls it the kane effect mo cider is probably patrick kane's biggest fan he got (laughs) airborne celebrating him with him in chicago like this whole team has been picking up what Patrick Kane has been bringing. And even if they're not like doing what he does on the ice, like you're not going to see Christian Fisher make jukes like Patrick Kane, but the energy he brings to the team they've, they've capitalized on. Absolutely. All right. Three players, Lucas Raymond, Miko Ranton and Mitch Marner. This is courtesy of Prashant Iyer. He, he pulled some stats and it's in our group chat. Five on five points per 60 at age 21. Mitch Marner, Lucas Raymond, Miko Ranton, and guess the order of highest to lowest. Lucas Raymond by a mile. At the high. No, um, Marner probably in first, and then I don't think Rantanen had a hot start, so I'll go Raymond Rantanen. That's right, Marner, Raymond Rantanen, packed in you know relatively not too far apart, but Raymond hovering. I think based on this, just above two and a half, uh, five and five points per sixty, and in Marner just under three, Rantanen under uh, like two point two five. Even strength expected goals above replacement. I'll tell you, Miko Rantanen and Mitch Marner at age 21 are pretty close together. Lucas Raymond above both of them right now. I'm not saying Lucas Raymond is going to be what Miko Rantanen is right now or what Mitch Marner is right now in the future. No, of course not. He'll be better. That's right. <laughs> but Lucas Raymond has all the tools. If you'll remember, you know, Brad, I hate this game, but Brad was very happy to play it because Brad was probably Lucas Raymond's biggest fan leading up to the draft where Detroit took him. And uh, you were asked, what's the comparable best case scenario? Like pie in the sky, what is the best case scenario? And you said Mitch Marner. A lot of the tools are there. The brain is there. Like the the drive so far, we've seen it as, as Evan mentioned, is there. It's not out of the question that this guy turns into a superstar. No, it's not at all out of the question. One of the points I was going to make about the way Raymond's playing. You guys uh, ended up really relaying a lot of it back to Patrick Kane, but he's doing a lot of things that there's another superstar in the league I see doing. And when you see an undersized forward who isn't the fastest, they have to really be able to manipulate the play around them, have the pace go as they want it, which again is something Patrick Kane's very good at, speeding things up, slowing things down, having the other team. Because when you can find seams and you can do things, you can manipulate the defense. And the guy I'm thinking of, and Raymond hasn't developed his shot yet to the same level, but a lot of the things he's doing lately are a lot of the things Nikita Kucherov does. Because, again, Kucherov's not a burner. He's not winning a ton of races, and he's not going to win a ton of physical battles. But he's so smart. He's got that competitiveness. He's got the hands. The only thing that Kucherov really definitively has right now that uh, Raymond doesn't is the shot. And it's not that Raymond has a bad shot, but it's not obviously Kucherov's shots like top five, top 10 in the league, um, which is why he's putting up 100 points and Raymond's only at, you know, 50, whatever right now. But there's a path where he becomes that type of player somewhere between that and Marner. I don't think Raymond's ever going to be a 100 point scorer. 
90? I don't think it's out of the question. I think, on that's, hot very, I think that's very possible. And as talent continues to increase around him as well, that will certainly help. You know, if Michael Rasmussen had 10% more finishing, I think Lucas Raymond may, may have had a lot more points. But no, I think we shouldn't, you know, take away from the fact that Lucas Raymond's having quite the watershed moment this season. And it's all, I would say most of it is because of him. What's the theme of the Red Wings so far this year with their improvement that we keep saying? They've gotten better. They're getting results. Yeah, the microstats, whatever. We, we'll, we have that argument a lot, but the goal differential is pretty indicative. They're playing a lot better than the other teams a lot of nights, and they still have so much room to grow ahead of them. Lucas Raymond is the same thing. He is doing so well this season. He has taken the step that he needed to take to bounce back from. It wasn't even like a catastrophic sophomore slump. It's not like he put up 10 points. He's still produced. But he just wasn't consistent. He took the step he needed to. He got stronger. He got more confident in his play. He's better on the boards, as Evan said. He More drive in his step. And you can still see exactly where he's going to get better. Brad just talked about his shot. We've seen Lucas Raymond focus on his shot and what he can do. I think he has so much room above his head with his shot. I think he has, you know, he can develop more tenacity. And you see he has, his nose gets dirty a lot. He's not afraid of that kind of play. So absolutely, I can see him developing more snarl to his game. I, I, there's a lot of space above Raymond's head, man. And I think some people are going to feel pretty silly for writing him off after last season, you know, three, four years from now when they see what he's doing. Oh, a hundred percent. And not that a ton of people are writing him off, but Hey, the sophomore slump is super common. He had it. Larkin had it. Nobody's complaining. Cause I think goal pace to this point in their careers, Raymond's actually outpacing what Larkin did at the same age. He leads the team right now in five on five scoring like yeah. uh, uh, points. Like his, he's not, He's been doing it quietly because he hasn't been like the biggest story. And I would still say over the balance of the season, Dylan Larkin's the team's MVP so far, but I don't know how it's going to end by the end of the year. Well, team MVP is probably going to be Alex Lyon at this point. <laughs> if, if they do, if they do make it, if they do make it Alex Lyon, it's, it's pretty much his to give away at that point. All right. That's a lot of good vibes. Let's talk about some speculation. The trade deadline. Uh, there's been more reporting on what's happening in terms of, Detroit's defense, uh, Emily Kaplan, obviously people keep pointing to the reporting that she had that Detroit is listening on their defensemen. Uh, we talked last episode where I, I told you, Brad, that I have a suspicion that Steve Weisman has probably begun to try to move a contract on defense. They have a little bit of a knot back there. You know, as well as it has gone, the defense has been Detroit's bane a lot of the year in terms of performance. Like, yes, Sherratt has done a lot better, but the whole Petrie Mata thing's not really working out that well. Do you try to find a buyer for Mata who is a lot of teams could find him valuable, maybe Hall, but it's just, it's hard to make that work, but you have to try not just for now, if you want to try to improve the defense for this playoff run, but also in the future, you have some cap problems coming up, which that's for later episodes, but you do have to offload some of those contracts or at least one of them. And it's going to happen, I think on defense and that reporting is out there that Detroit is, is Listening on their defensemen is the same as shopping them. Yeah, they're listening on their defensemen. Probably Mata. They probably would prefer Hole, but I don't think that contract's movable, at least not yet. Maybe next year when there's only a year and a half on it left. And of course, there's the reports that they are looking for a defenseman, yeah. preferably one with a bit more snarl, yeah. a bit tougher to play against. And given the Red Wings cap situation... This is one of those weird scenarios where even though I firmly believe the Red Wings aren't a in a spot where they should just straight up buy rental players, but with the cap scenario or the cap gymnastics they're going to have to do shortly, the, we'll call it ineffectiveness of the defense relative to some of these contracts, it probably would make sense to move out uh, one of the defensemen with term, which is all of them but Gossespear, obviously not Cider Wallman. Shrot, but and bring back a defenseman on an expiring contract. Solve that's a, pro a good point. Find yourself some maneuverability. Yeah, that's the old. That's a good way to buy a rental. You're right. Yeah, you get yourself future cap flexibility. You upgrade the defenseman to even if it's not an upgrade, someone who's a little more of the style you're looking for. I know he's been bad this year, but I keep seeing his name pop up, so we'll just use it as an example. You move out a Mata to Arizona who could use them. You bring in a Matt Dumba 
His contract expires this year. You've got the cap flexibility for next year. There's your Edvinson solution for next year, mm-hmm. right? You just, okay, when the expiring contract in this scenario, Dumba, is gone, that's Edvinson's spot. You've solved the problem for this year, and you've cr- created some cap flexibility. And unlike other scenarios we've talked about like this around the trade deadline, this one's not all that complicated. It's just finding the right team with the right player that you want. And again, I haven't scoured the trade market to know every, you know, big, burly, nasty defenseman that's available, but something like that could make sense. I hate to play the what if game, but a a guy I really liked in the off season that was available, and this happened previously as well with Zadorov, but I was like, man, Detroit brought in Radko Gudas. Like, yes, he got three years at 4 million. It's like, do you really want to be paying Radko Gudas for what he does on the ice? 4 million. I yes, know, I think a lot yes, of teams, a lot of teams would right now, and I'm like, you're you're playing what if? And hindsight's twenty twenty, but for the the contracts that Detroit signed on defense, man, how nice would it be to have Radko Gudas in in that position right now? Oh, he shoots right. That's a big plus, and I would like it. But I think the last thing the Red Wings should be doing right now is adding more term on no. defense, unless it's a you know top three level defenseman. It's hard to to prioritize future cap right now because again, it is a thing. Like Detroit's going to have to make some decisions in the future, and you you hope that they avoid, you know, bridging Cider and Raymond. Uh, but we'll see what happens on that front. But yeah, in the short term, you try to bring in some snarl in the blue line. I'm I have a you know this is this guy's like the the bell of the ball right now. But Chris Tanev could be somebody. He's expiring. I think he makes like four and a half mil or something. But his name's been on every single trade list I've seen, so I'm not sure you want to get involved in that. And I think he's only got like a limited no move clause, like he submits a short list or something like that. So he's maybe a guy you could bring in, but like I said, I'm not a huge fan of going after the guys that you see on every single list because you know every team is looking at him, and that only drives the cost up. Chris Tanev is exactly what the Red Wings would want, what they need, what everything I just talked about. But like you said, the only reason I didn't bring him up is there's a lot of big offers on the table for him, but none involving a first round pick, which is what's what Calgary's holding out for. And Detroit damn well better not be the guy, the guy giving up a first round pick for a rental. If Detroit was in Florida or Boston's position right now, like that point, yeah. Yeah, they, their team is that strong all year. Yeah, then you're starting to part with your first round picks because they're pick 25 and you're going for the cup. We're we're higher on the Red Wings right now than is probably rational or we ever have been, but you're not paying first round picks for rentals quite yet. Not sure if we we're going to talk about the Flyers or not, but with Jamie Drysdale going down, not totally sure what their plan is for the season. I don't think they ever really envisioned themselves being in a playoff position at this point in the season. But they've been talking about moving some of their defensemen. I don't know if there's anything there that could be arranged. Sealer and Walker would make a lot of sense, but once again, I keep hearing their names. Exactly, coming up. that's the problem. Is there's going to be the bigger teams, the true cup contenders, and they'll be willing to outbid. And there's, you know, the trade deadline's weird, where some of the markets just dry up and. GMs just take the best offer. Maybe that's what Steve Eisman looks to play off of. Or, you know, you look at another team who's, you know, really in the dumps. Maybe you can exploit something there. I don't know. But I, yeah, getting, I like the idea of bringing in a UFA, moving someone with term. It, I don't know what that would end up costing because, you know, not all the GMs in the NHL are dumb, but I think they would catch on to that move pretty quick. But, you know, stranger things have happened. Do we, do we want to do a second? I'm the right. I, I tweeted this out. I'm the right amount of delusional to talk about Elias Pettersson. <laughs> <laughs> this is getting crazy. Like, this isn't for all. Like, this is just fun. But, hey, he has not signed in Vancouver yet. That It's not nothing. What I will get ahead of and say, Vancouver's not trading him at the deadline. They're in the battle for the President's Trophy right now. They are trying to win a Stanley Cup. And Pettersson's an RFA at the end of the year. So they have zero risk riding this out to the end of the season. But, 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 if he is not willing to sign a long-term extension as an RFA, you have the Alex DeBrinkett situation. Or even though Ottawa thought they were on the come up, God, I love saying thought. And 
they knew that they they were not in a position where they could just let a player of Alex DeBrinket's caliber go for nothing. Vancouver might very well be in the same situation with Elias Pettersson to the millionth degree because obviously Pettersson's a lot better than DeBrinket. So, and his contract starts with twelve, probably. Yeah, you have to understand that you're not getting him cheap like you got DeBrinket. I think, and I know we talked about this a lot in the group chat. This deal, if you're looking for what the structure is, you probably start with the Jack Eichel deal yeah. and work your way up or down on certain pieces based on whatever. Jack Eichel had the cost certainty. Elias Pettersson doesn't. Jack Eichel's a little cheaper. Pettersson will obviously come in for more money. I would argue Jack Eichel's a better player, but Elias Pettersson isn't coming off neck surgery. Well, that was a first-round pick, Krebs, Tuck and a mid round pick. We'll call it a th- second or a third, just for the on the high end. I can't actually remember off the top of my head. So the Red Wings equivalent, a first is a first. There you go. There's one obvious. Your Peyton Krebs, a really good, albeit not top level prospect. Probably Marco Casper. Alex Tuck, eight people underrate Alex Tuck. They a do. really, really good roster player relatively young roster player i don't know if the red wings have a great one-to-one on the roster to what alex tuck is you offer i think he's probably closer to lucas raymond than he is michael rasmussen i wouldn't give up raymond and i wouldn't put them in the same tier as what tuck was because of age but in terms of production that's not far off what tuck was at the time of the trade so if you're just throwing in rasmussen and you know wiping your hands and going that's going to do it because the catch 22 is Vancouver doesn't want to regress either. So you're probably throwing a roster player over there. Bear Grin would be the easy fit in there, but he's not accomplishing what he's Tuck did. He's nowhere near what Tuck did. Yeah. But he's a, he's a player who could produce over there. But where you could get away with this then is that fourth piece in the Eichel trade was not of significance. If you give a lesser roster player, let's say for a hypothetical sake, Rasmussen, that next piece would also probably have to be a good prospect, a one you're going to be uncomfortable losing. Johansson, Mazer, something along those lines. You're not getting away with throwing someone like an Amadeus Lombardi, hypothetically, as the kicker. So there's a million ways you could tweak this, but that is probably the core of what you're looking at for this trade. Mm-hmm. You're delusional. You're absolutely delusional, Ryan, because Vancouver is going to do everything in their power to keep him. And that's still the most likely outcome. But Teams that have the cap space and the buying power to do this is probably a very short list, and Detroit's on it. That, and that's why I, I say it. Like it, it will, it will make a tough cap situation tougher, but it's tough relative to what we know, which is that Detroit's had infinity cap space forever now. Good teams find cap space. You pay assets to unload cap space. Because here's the crazy thing that we haven't even brought up in this: Scott Wheeler has been doing his prospect pool farm system rankings for all NHL. And obviously he's done 30 teams already, so we're, we know where Detroit ranks, and that gives you a good idea of what their asset value is around the NHL, except we don't. Detroit's in the top two, which haven't been announced yet. So not only are they firmly a playoff team right now, they have one of the two best prospect systems in, in the entire league. Like, they are unbelievably well-positioned for future growth, assets and trades, and... Their cap situation isn't as good as Red Wings fans make it out to be, but it is workable. The, and that, that like helps for the delusional Patterson in the future, whatever game breaker you add to this top six to make this a contending team conversation, you have to fix the defense a little bit, but I digress. But it also means this deadline, they can go shopping and not really break the bank within reason. We'll keep you posted. Thank you for bearing with my Pedersen delusional uh, talk here. A quick piece of positive news before we get into the ugliness of the ads on jerseys, but I have to do it. Uh, first, Sebastian Kosa, AHL Player of the Week. We talked about him previously, you know, after his huge win to to stop the Milwaukee 19-game win streak to, to extend Grand Rapids' point streak to 15 games. As of February 26th, that was, he is up to a 9 11 save percentage on the season. And for him, he started off much lower than that as he was getting accustomed to pro hockey in the AHL. And it's not really like the easiest league to, to come into as a goal in his situation. He has been lights out. It was 
stopping 65 of 67 shots over two uh, Griffin's wins, including a shutout uh, Max tweeted out. So that is like Kosa, man. Brad and I talked about him recently, but again, in the midst of all this positive news at the Red Wings level, you want to know why their pipeline's looking good. They now have two goalies in Kosa and Augustine who are looking to be challenging for the Red Wings net in the future. Yeah, and Kosa's definitely, you know, sort of followed the same storyline as the Griffins, right? The Griffins didn't start off that great this year, but they've been finding their way, and now they're really starting to put it on, and Kosa's obviously a big factor in that. Not that it's necessarily going to be Kosa that's going to be factoring into this, but you also look at how well the Griffins are playing, and you do some math in your head of who has to come up on a cheap contract to to make the cap work. It means entry-level contracts, and it's nice to know that you have some options down in Grand Rapids. All right, let's 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 get into what's not going to be popular with the fans. Everyone knows my opinion. I think ads are everywhere, of course. We have ads on this podcast, but the jerseys for me were always the, the sacred space. And the NHL broke through that mold recently. And as Red Wings fans, we've been, I think, spoiled, to, to put it honestly, that the jersey has been untouched until now. I didn't really want to acknowledge it because I knew it would change at any moment. And that moment is here. As of Thursday, February 29th, the game against the Islanders, the Red Wings will have an ad on their front of their jersey, the shoulder patch like a lot of other teams in the league have. So it's not official as to what it is yet, so I, I, I won't like talk about it on air because I don't know precisely how it's going to look. But there is going to be an ad on the jersey. I wonder if this is going to be reflected in the Tigers as well, obviously with the Illiches owning both. But yeah, not fun. I I know it doesn't mean anything. I know people are going to be say stop whining. This doesn't actually matter. It's just looks on the ice. Well, but it's your podcast. You can say whatever you want. That's right. That's why you're on here. Exactly. I Must be a down year for uh, the 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 revenues. I think you know you really teams in a bad spot. Ticket sales are probably slumping. So you got to really make a cash injection into that bottom line. You know what I will say here? Blame goes to ownership a lot, and that's fair. It should across the league. They wanted this. They wanted the revenue. The league office wanted this. You know who else wanted this? The players. They will take that extra money over the ad on the, they don't care about the ad on the jersey. They, the NHL Players Association, they saw their escrow debt. They saw, you know, what it could mean for increasing the salary cap. And that's a, I mean, a good business decision from them. But everyone that is involved with making money from the NHL is in favor of this because it's extra revenue for them. Ah. The, 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 the honeymoon phase is over for the Red Wings on that front. I think one thing that's sort of a saving grace or helps me feel better about this uh, is the fact that every major sports league in North America except the NFL now has jersey ads in some capacity. So it's not like the NHL is looking like a Mickey Mouse league because they're putting ads all over their jerseys. It seems to be part of the times right now in every league except the NFL. I have a bad habit of dying on hills and for like for no reason. I'll never change my opinion on this. I, I think there's configurations of ads on jerseys that look like the least offensive possible. Like the Leafs jersey ad is perfect. It's the lens in. It's just a white text on a blue jersey. It's and it's fine. You don't notice it other than the fact that it says milk. And, no, but it suits them because <laughs> they're a bunch of milk drinkers. Exactly. <laughs> like, But no, in all seriousness, like if it blends into the jerseys motif pretty well, I think Minnesota's is god awful. Like, uh, it's terrible. I think the, the way the Montreal Canadians, like they might think that it works well with the blue contrast, but for me, I'm like, it's so obnoxious. There's no good Jersey ad. There's just the least offensive ones in my mind. That's what you, that's where you need to strike it. Yeah. It needs to be the least offensive. Boy, how rattled are you going to be when you get that bright orange Little Caesars look on there? That one I kind of mess with, though. Like, that one almost fits, but you know what? Like, it is what it is. I'm never going to be happy about it. I'll harp on it too much. People will tell me to shut up and let it go, and they'll be right. And the world will turn, and the NHL and the NHLPA will make more money. And the, you know what? When the salary cap goes up because of it, and all of a sudden we can afford Elias Pettersson, then I'll shut up about it. That, that's my deal. That's why I stopped dying on that hill. I don't know if I should save this for later. But have you seen the Fanatics MLB jerseys oh, and dude, pants so far? Dude. They're it's oh. it's bulge gate right now. <laughs> the number the number of bulges. Oh my god. When they started doing all the promos, everyone's like, that's a penis. <laughs> <laughs> and I showed Catherine, she's like, I like baseball. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm just kidding. She didn't say that. But since we're on the conversation of jerseys, I thought I'd bring that up because, you know, that really is sort of the wave that the NHL is riding as they've now partnered with Fanatics as well. So it brings me great concern seeing that shitstorm sort of surge right now. Does it make the jersey ad better or worse when Fanatics inevitably misspells the company name? It, Yeah, the fact that the jersey ads are the least of our concerns coming with jerseys is... And Vintage Detroit has already like said they're, they're starting to run out of uh, the Adidas Prime Green. Like They're running out of the sizes and Adidas doesn't ship new shipments anymore. Like They're done. So... Oh, I've seen some promising stuff in terms of fanatics taking over like existing factories and stuff, but you never underestimate the ability for greed to ruin something good. No, fanatics is a company that has absolutely lost all benefit of the doubt. Yes. It's shocking. Nike's embedded with them in the MLB yeah. thing too. It's shocking how bad they are at their jobs. Well, just seeing the last year's, you know, game worn jerseys versus this year's so far. It's catastrophic. So I'm struggling to be an optimist on as an NHL fan on this, but you know, I gotta, I can only work with the proof I've got. And I'm, uh, I'm very concerned with what I'm seeing. All right. Let's, let's in our hearts have more of Hutch slamming a beer and getting the crowd pumped up and let's about the Jersey ads. Let's jump into overtime. Overtime is brought to you by our Patreon supporters, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast. Again, we can only host winged wheel podcast nights uh, in partnership with the Detroit Red Wings and the Grand Rapids Griffins because of our Patreon supporters. Additionally, we're also able to, you know, support the Jamie Daniels Foundation, uh, more expanded content like expected by whom and, and hopefully some more stuff coming in the works here. So uh, it allows us to do all that. And of course, you get benefits, the two tickets to every home game that we give away uh, to random patrons. We also have the discord and the bonus episodes. Brad and I recorded for 47 minutes last overtime. We had a great debate between Bedard and Makar. Uh, go listen. God, to- I'm so glad I missed that. Yeah. <laughs> go. Well, we also played a game. <laughs> yeah, we did. It was, a, that was a fun one. Go back and listen to that one. But again, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast. And before I get into it again, the details of the event, you're going to be getting an email from the Detroit Red Wings. If you don't get that email by tomorrow, end of day, go to the ticket purchasing link and then email the email address that you see on there for the contact. You'll have a voucher and your ticket to get into the event. That's where you get the hat Budweiser beer garden at the LCA and you get in at 12 PM doors open at noon and the podcast starts recording at 1230. So reach out to them. If you don't have that email or shoot us a message and we'll try to help you out as best as we can. Before we start now, I'm now I'm curious. All right, Evan, you're not allowed to defend your position. You're not allowed to think about it too long. You get a, one of two choices. Option A, you can have Connor Bedard and Michael Rasmussen or option B, Kale McCarr and Nate Danielson. Basically, they're saying in one of those drafts. We don't need context. Evan. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take Kale McCarr and Nate Danielson. Oh my guy. God. All right. On to overtime. All right, let's take some questions from our <laughs> patrons. Dominic Belvedere says, the vibes couldn't be higher. I'm all in and ready to get hurt again. Outside of Dan Campbell, who do you want giving the pregame speech before the first playoff game? Marshall Mathers. That's a good one. You know what? Yeah. I know it's not the same tune as Marshall Mathers, not pure hype, but for anyone who watched the newsroom, Jeff Daniels is a huge Red Wings fan, and that man can deliver a speech. Yeah. He's although not maybe not in a hockey locker room type of way. Yeah, maybe not that way. It's a lot more. It's more of a slow burn. But man, he can get you going. (laughs) Give Woman the heart says, "Is this the best arrangement of the top six the Wings have put forward this year?" Raymond is really driving that second line and allowing us to stack our top line with Larkin and Kane. Hard to argue against the results. Yeah, without a doubt in my mind. Walt Partlow says, I know that Sprong should get a decent payday in free agency, but do you think there's any chance he'd take the same deal as Rasmussen? People seem to think he can get $4 million plus in free agency, but maybe he'd like the term in the place that he seems to like. I think he's getting more dollars than that with that term. Yeah, it's it's goal scoring comes at a premium in the NHL. That's the only thing that... Like, I, I do think there's something to be said about it's working here, so don't mess with a good thing. But Daniel Sprong's made it work multiple places now with not a ton of opportunity in terms of ice time. Like a, a league driven by goal scoring in terms of your payday, you he's going to capitalize on it, right? He has to. If I was him, I would. It's going to be hard to lose that, though. It's going to be very hard to lose that. 
AJ Voss says the ongoing train wreck that is the Sabres rebuild deserves a 30 for 30. Since their last playoff appearance in 2011, they've moved their first five first round picks, Grigorenko, Ristolainen, Reinhardt, Eichel, and Alex Nylander, with their sixth straight first round pick, Middlestat, in 2017, currently on the trading block. All while their major prospects, other than Savoy, are currently struggling with the NHL club. This was supposed to be an emergency year for them, but they have $7 million in cap space. Do they just expect their prospects to suddenly become good one day, despite the, giving them nothing to work with or learn from? Yeah. <laughs> they, people point to Buffalo, and rightly so, and they're like, this is why going too hard in one direction doesn't work. And Buffalo has really changed my opinion on what rebuilds should be over the year. Because I used to be sell everything, stockpile picks and prospects as much as possible until you're good. And then I saw what it's like to have a steadying hand in the organization and now a team with them scattered throughout with the Red Wings. I, I think Buffalo is going to be wanting to lean more in Detroit's direction in the future. First of all, it sounds like they should have drafted better if they're moving all of their first round picks. And second of all, I think you need to have a strong leadership and executive group to really navigate you through a rebuild. And, you know, all those things combined have kind of led Buffalo to where they've been over the past decade. Jack's dad says of all the possible candidates to move at the deadline, who has the most value if moved and who has the most value to stay? Is it worth keeping any of our pending UFAs on the roster to see the possible playoff run through at the risk of losing them for nothing in the offseason? In my opinion, there isn't enough value in individual trades to give up what we have to collectively give up to make the playoff push. Yes, absolutely. They're not going to be sellers. They're looking to move some dead weight, but that's not the same thing. There's a conversation, and I know this is insane to say on the heels of the night he just had, but there's a conversation to be had about Gosses Bear because you know almost guaranteed that's likely to go depending on what he wants in the future in Detroit situation. But what uh, does he get though? Does he get you a first round pick? If he gets you a first, then you have to you have to really you know, think. Yeah, but he's not going to. And that's the that's the conversation. So right now, it's one of those unique years. Like, yeah, we're talking like the vibes and we're very excited about the playoffs. So there's a little bit of prejudice for our opinion there. But this is also a unique year where there's not really a lot of motivation right now to do it. If Detroit had Pittsburgh's cupboard, then yes, you, you have to restock it. But Detroit's not hurting. Brad just talked about how high up Detroit's prospect pool is. So we'll see. Uh, this one from Lars Thorzell says, do you think there's a shot for Detroit to straight up make the playoffs and drop the Leafs to the wild card? I reckon that should be the long-term target for the last quarter of the season. Sure, one game at a time and all those empty calorie statements, but damn if we could pass the Leafs before game 82. Hunt them down and enjoy the sweet, sweet music of Toronto-based pod squeal. Oh, that'd be phenomenal. If that, that should be the goal. Is it a reasonable goal? Eh, maybe it's a bit optimistic, but that should be the goal. If we're talking hockey-related revenue... The Rangers versus the Leafs in the first round would get rid of all escrow for the next hundred years. Oh my God! Well, to be fair, uh, if you look at points percentage, I believe right now because games in hand, uh, the first round right now would be Boston Toronto because I think Florida's got the points percentage of Boston. The NHL would have paid for that last year. Like they would have paid whatever deity they had to pay to make that happen. They would have made the sacrifice just for the sheer revenue that would bring in. <laughs> also on the topic, like we're going to talk more about this later, but Detroit is in that mix of like when they are good, the league is, but the whole league benefits from it. Don't think that the rest of the league isn't happy that Detroit's in this mix right now. And on that theme, Don Bonderlay, King of the Dirty Songs uh, says, I love Sprong, but why give him a raise when you could possibly slot Berggren in that spot next season? Likely similar production and both seem to have defensive concerns, but Berggren would come cheaper or has the Berggren bridge been burnt and no way he signs a contract. I don't think Berggren does what Sprong does. If you can guarantee Berggren could score the way Sprong would score, then yeah, I'm all for it. But well, then you wouldn't have brought in Daniel Sprong. Well, I, I don't think you ever pass up the opportunity to bring up Daniel Sprong in 20 goals, but yeah, it would make it easier to not to lose him for sure. But 20 goals is not easy to score in the NHL. I know it's easier than in the past, but if it was easy... Every team would do what Detroit did. Detroit just was smart and lucky that they got Sprong for as cheap as they did. Is the bridge burnt? I don't know that I'd call it burnt. A lot of things can turn around. You know, let's see a world where because of injury or whatever, Berggren comes in, has a, a hot streak. The crowd loves him. The vibes are good. Good relationship with management at that point. Things can change in an instant. I'll say it's not trending in the right direction for sure, though. Like keeping him down there has come at a cost of his frustration, and and that's palpable and it's real. So that'll be 
it'll be a hill to overcome if Detroit wants to keep him in the org. All right. We're going to wrap up this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast. We will see you all at Winged Wheel Podcast Day at the LCA on Saturday, March 2nd. And we'll be back with you on Sunday. Thank you all so much for tuning in, for putting up with maybe our like sickly sweet positive vibes. But this is fun. Red Wings fans deserve this. If you're a new listener, welcome to the show. We've always been this positive. Don't worry about it. And if you're a listener of old, you deserve this. Uh, to all of our Patreon supporters, thank you so much. We cannot have done this without you. And to our name level supporters on Patreon. Arjun Shanker, Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sarah Grand Foundation, Akefer, Samuel Soderholm, Icon, Brad's Lord and Savior, Bradley Cleveland, Glenn Brabham, Asker Stan, Croner's Left Knee, Ashley Van Conant, Sea Lion, Keenan O'Donoghue, Yanni Burgers, Meals on Wheels, Matthew M. Rice, Admiral Matt S. of the Cheeseback Navy, Carl Brutina Nenaluski, Carl Provi, Citizen High Five, Clip Clop Nene, Connor Scovey, Craig Kibble, Denny's Gamer Girl, Derek Enstam, DJ Denton, God Creatives, Give Blood Fight Probert, Hockey Town Love, Hockey Town Matt, Hassam Al Qasem, I still don't like Patrick Kane, I'm Ryan, Nine Year Hannah, Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Joel Miranda, Jonathan Miller, Kaylin Wood, Marcus, Marlon Winchester, Matt K, Cannon Fodder to the Cheesebag Army, Matt McKay, Michael Edland, RA, Red Feather Desert Dogs, Ryan Hubbard, Ryan 50 Hannah Cap Hannah, Scott Martin, Scree and Lube, That's What I Appreciate About You, Wallman's Elite Dancing D, Iser Plan Stan, General Andy Bohan of the Cheesebag Army, Sam Bankson, AB, Adam Rose, Antonio Gracias, Axel Sandy Pelica, Bellingham Acid Balls, Brad Simmons, Brian Vasha, Chuck Buffchest, the Tarpless Goon, Commander Ben Barron of the Cheesebag Space Force, Connor, Connor Leighton, Corey Prita, Darren Ficht, D Boss Snip Show, Derek James, Dungeon Master of Puppets, Frank Stanley, Gene Sullivan, Griffey Boy, James Pridemore, Jeremiah Dobo, JM Rhapsody, Jogan Rafferty Fan Club, John Evans Derogatory, John Ingalls, Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Les Grossman's Ungodly Firestorm, Linda Hull, Maximilian, Melissa Erickson, Michigan Boy and Avs Country, new name level supporter, welcome. Ophelia, Reed, Shahid Syed, name level supporter, welcome to the Dub Dub Club. Steven, the Hodag, the Mexinadian, the Hat123, winging it in San Diego, ex formerly AA Ron, and your second favorite patron. We'll see you all Saturday in Detroit. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.